Hi, today we are here to talk to Hugh Mason, the co-founder and CEO of JFDI. JFDI is a highly successful incubator based in Singapore. And Hugh Mason has a fantastic story to tell. He comes from Britain and has now settled down in Singapore. So let's have a great talk with Hugh Mason today. Thanks very much for joining us on this uh, pilot episode, I would say. It's an honor. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, you've been uh, a kind of a science geek and then you, know, mm. uh, you produced uh, some computer games and then you went on to produce a television series on, around science for BBC and now here you're running a highly successful incubator mm. in this part of Asia. Well, could you just take us through a little bit of your story? How did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder that. I'm 49 and you look back on your life, you know, when you get to sort of our kind of age, you think, well, how did that happen, don't you? And I think for me, the thread that runs through it all is innovation. I've always been fascinated since I was a kid by new ideas. My mum used to tell this story about just after I was born, apparently I started playing with a clip on my umbilical cord to see what would happen. <laughs> Um, I'm glad that experiment didn't kind of progress any further, otherwise I probably wouldn't be here. Um, but I've always been very interested in seeing how ideas translate into reality. Um, it was a privilege working at the BBC, making science and technology films, uh, working with uh, Nobel Prize winners, ordinary inventors, all sorts of engineers trying to make things happen. Um, I'm fascinated by ideas, but I like seeing them turn into reality. And so when I look back on my career, um, that's what it's all been about, really. And I think one of the things as the, a new sort of science of startups and a new academic understanding of entrepreneurship has come about, I think uh, many people realize that storytelling, the ability to make sense of a complex reality and run a line through it, um, is an incredibly important skill for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, you're a journalist and, and so am I, and that's what we've been paid to do, really. In a funny sort of way, I feel like all my life I've been paid to tell stories. When you write a business plan, it's a rather peculiar format of a story. But it's no more weird than a film script. You know, it's a story about a group of people who are going to try and do something and how they're going to do it. Um, and I guess, um, in a sense, the uh, you know, a startup is like a, a community activity. A group of people come together. It's not just about the entrepreneurs. It's about the investors around them. It's around the men about the mentors around them. And a critical thing that people ask themselves is, you know, why are we doing this and are we making any progress? So I think storytelling is what holds it all together, actually. It's one of the reasons why sometimes accelerators and incubators are criticized for putting too much emphasis on a pitch day, a demo day. And I actually think there's something to be said for it, because it's if you can't explain your business in five to six minutes and tell a convincing story as to why it's worth taking further, then what have you actually got? You know, human beings grew up in caves telling each other stories. And it's the most basic form of, of communication. And I think it's incredibly valuable still to this day to help, to help people make sense of what they're doing. Incubator that you run here, uh, Joyful Frog Digital Incubator. What's been your experience here in Singapore running this incubator? What kind of startups you come across and how do you see the whole mm. spirit around the startups? So I think one of the biggest challenges for us has been not only to introduce a new methodology to Asia, we were the first people really to bring that lean startup method into Southeast Asia, and we were the first accelerator in Southeast Asia. Um, it, it's been a, a challenge not just to introduce a new method, but also to adapt it locally. Now what's come out of that um, has been a, a lot of experience. We, we, um, we reckoned fairly early on that we wouldn't be good at picking winners. You know, at the stage we're picking businesses, it's very, very hard to identify winners. But systematically, if you look for losers, it's much easier to identify companies and teams which have got fundamental flaws in them. So the way numbers work for us is for every 100 teams that apply to JFDI, we find we have to reject 96% of them, 96%, because there's something fundamentally wrong with them. So anyway, 4% of the teams come in. About 50 to 60% of the teams get funded, on average at about 500,000, 700,000 US dollars. 
Um, and of those five teams, so 50% uh, that get funded, um, then about one in five, one in eight goes on to become a potential $100 million plus business. But it's those ones that actually create a return for us. We, we invest 50,000 Singapore dollars, about 40,000 US dollars at the beginning of our program. Um, and uh, we usually take about 9%, 8 or 9% of the business for that. Um, and the business model for the accelerator we've been running is based on the idea that eventually some of those companies will exit. <clears throat> so to answer, going right back to your question, what kinds of businesses have worked? We are very responsive to what investors want because we see we're at the beginning of a sort of staircase of growth and our job is to get companies from zero to one where they have some evidence of some traction in the market, they've understood a problem worth solving, they've put together a solution for it, the market's shown some interest. Then the seed stage investors that follow on us have to get them from one to ten, which is where you're transforming the business from being a startup into a scale up. And then someone that comes in at level ten and injects um, you know, um, series B or C level venture capital is going to take it from ten to a hundred or ten to a thousand. So it's a series of handovers, if you like. And in that sense, one of the things that it's sometimes quite hard to do is to help startup founders who are not experienced to, to look further ahead. Uh, you can create a business which is great for you and your friends and does something brilliant technically, but unless it matches the interests of not just customers but also investors further up the staircase, you're not going to get it funded and it's not going to grow. So again, that's one of the critical sort of flaws that we see actually being over the years, we've done more and more business-to-business -business stuff. Um, software as a service applications work very well. Probably our most successful business is Trade Gecko, which is a supply chain management system for SMEs. If you're Walmart, you can buy SAP. If you're a tra if you're a SME, you'd buy Trade Gecko. Uh, you uh, earlier you mentioned about you know, the whole storytelling bit. So I mean, as an investor, what are the kind of stories uh, that really excite you? We always think what's the end we're trying to create. Someone said to me the other day that strategy is about working out what is wow and then working out how. How do you get to the wow? And for our investors at seed stage, so our investors are typically folk investing in Singapore, half a million dollars, um, Singaporean up to $800,000, that kind of range. For them, what they want to see more than anything is traction. We hear a lot of stories in, if you read US startup press, about huge user numbers, you know, companies that have got 100,000 users, but none of them are paying anything. Now here in Asia, investors don't, are not impressed by that. In America, they'd say, don't worry, we'll figure out the monetization later, get the eyeballs, it's the attention of consumers that's important. Here in Asia, people have got many investment opportunities. You know, you can still make very good money out of shopping malls or condos. Um, and when you look at a, uh, a tech startup, if you're an Asian investor, you say, well, hang on, I could stick my money in a piece of real estate and I could sell it again in nine months' time if I need the cash. Whereas if I put cash into this tech startup thing, they've got all these fancy numbers, but none of it's monetized, and then you're telling me in five years' time I'm going to get a big load of money, maybe? Why would I do that? So there is a sort of mind shift that has to happen. There needs to be um, definitely education on both sides, education for investors about what to look for and education for startups about how to create it. And the story that we tell on our demo day is actually very specific because having you know, Meng, my co-founder, and I having been angel investors, we've sat through hundreds and hundreds of bad startup pitches. Um, and so the way we work it is to say that in a six-minute pitch, you only get six minutes, that's the time you ought to be able to convince someone that's worth meeting or not. The first three minutes are all about saying, what is the problem I'm solving? What's, how does the solution, and I need to really feel the pain of that problem. I need to know it's a problem that someone feels every day, painfully, that they've tried existing solutions to it, they haven't worked, and that there is immense frustration and incentive for a customer to actually buy this thing. Then we need to show that the solution actually addresses that problem, and we need to show evidence, not just that we think it addresses the problem, but that customers address it. In other words, that they're signing up. And then finally, we need to show that the market actually wants the solution because sometimes you can have a great technology that nobody actually wants. So for example, knives and forks are a great technology for eating food, but if I take them to China, no one's going to buy them, you know, because they've got chopsticks. So sometimes you can have a solution that, that um, actually the market doesn't want. So the really critical statistics are is what, what actual evidence of traction is there? What actual evidence is there that the market wants this thing? And then the second half of the pitch, um, we get the teams to talk about 
um, the, their vision for the business and how it could grow. So if you like the first half of our story that we're telling our investors is it takes away all the reasons to say no. You know, the first question that goes through your mind as an investor is what the hell is this company doing? Do they actually have anything? Does anyone care? And how do they make money? And if those questions have been answered, you think, oh, that's quite unusual. 150 out of 200 companies that I hear don't tell me those things. <laughs> so now you've got my attention. Now you've got my attention. OK, so now tell me the big story. So the second half of the story that they tell is usually about how this business could scale, how it could grow, why it um, has opportunity to grow significantly beyond what it is. But we are always saying to our startups, when they join us, it's you as a team that we're more interested in than your idea. And we're interested in, is there a balance of skills on a team? We're interested in, do they have any domain expertise? So if a company says that they want to do e-commerce for women's shoes, it's very easy to make a sort of MBA style argument, you know, about why women's shoes are a fairly high value, physically small product, and therefore they should make a good case for e-commerce. A very business school sort of logic. But unless you've actually worked in fashion retail and ideally been a consumer of that product, then what typically will happen with a business is you'll you'll push it for a little while, you'll hit a bump in the road, like everybody does, and then you'll give up. So we're looking for teams that have a genuine passion for the domain in which they're operating and that can provide some kind of argument as to why they're the best team in the world to do this thing. So you can see now when I say that 96% of the teams that apply to us have got a fundamentally flawed, you know, we have a very checklist based approach um, to working with startups and um, it's astonishing how many of them just fall down on, on those kinds of basic things. We know that those checklists work because if we look at the number of teams that come into our program and get funded, it's about 50%. The number of teams that we reject when we've gone back and looked, about 5% of them get funded independently. Now, funding is not success. It's only a proxy for success. But I think it indicates that something about our selection or our program seems to be working. You know, we're a big, a big inspiration for us is um, Atul Gawande. I don't know if you've come across his books. There's a wonderful book he wrote called The Checklist Manifesto. He's an Indian surgeon working in the US, works for the World Health Organization. His job is to try and make uh, surgery less risky. Um, around the world, there is one profession which has really, really taken checklists to heart, and it's the aviation industry. And the reason aviation is so safe is because pilots put their egos aside and they use checklists before they take off. When they've brought that same approach into operating theatres, it's horrifying how many mistakes disappear. You know, the number of deaths in intensive care fall by 70%, 70%. So in a sense, all we're trying to do is to apply the same um, methodical, uh, rigorous, step-by-step -step approach to debugging startups. We think of startups as being a bit like computer programs that you can, you can debug. There will always be an element of risk but um, there's also an opportunity to just avoid making stupid mistakes. You know, if a, team doesn't, if a team doesn't deliver because they're trying something new and it just doesn't work, that's fine. That's a heroic uh, exploration. Um, if you fail because of something stupid, what was a known reason for failing, then that's just dumb. <laughs> so, so, so what happens to those 96% of the companies? They, um, some of them, um, we are able to kind of redirect them to think harder about their products. Many of them, to be honest, are quite deluded. I think there is so much um, hype about startups right now that many, many people believe it must be easy. Um, we created a program for startups, a pre-accelerator program called JFDI Discover. And I think of it as being a bit like a gym. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to lose weight, but you, you, know, I, you can look at me and you can see, well, he hasn't actually put the effort in. Lots of people would like to do a startup, build their own business, but are they prepared to actually work out and make it work? So we created a kind of gym for wannabe entrepreneurs, if you like. What's fascinating is it's only 21 days long. And the psychology of it when we designed it is that we thought, well, it'll be exactly like a gym. When you go to a gym, you sign up, you meet the trainer, the trainer shows you how to use the machines and says, here's a program, let's talk again in two weeks. And he knows that 85% of people won't be there in two weeks. <laughs> and in fact, it's a little known secret that the, that the business model of gyms would fall apart if that weren't the case. They've only got enough machines typically to service 15 or 20% of the people who sign up. So that's why gyms charge a large sign up fee and then a subscription. In the same way with our 21 day JFDI Discover program, it's aimed to help you discover who is my customer, 
Um, what problem am I solving for them? Do I want to be an entrepreneur? And do I want to be in business with these people in my team? And within two weeks, um, something like 70% of people have just dropped out because it wasn't what they expected. And we think that's a good result. You know, if you go on a flower arranging course for a weekend, it doesn't mean you want to be a florist, but at least you've had a go. And then you can say, well, I know something about arranging flowers now, or a portraiture course, course you know. Of the 30% of teams that make it to the end of our JFDI Discover program, I'd say that half of them are still absolutely deluded. They'll, they'll say, Hugh, I look up the evidence, you've helped me gather this evidence, and I know the customers say they don't want this. But throughout history, brilliant inventors have been told that you know their idea isn't going to work, and if I only find the right person, they'll give me a million dollars. And I, I can't help people like that. You know, that's just delusion. So what typically happens at the end of our pre-accelerator course is there's about 15% of the people that start who are a bit depressed now because their original idea didn't work out. But they've done all the exercises we asked them to do. They've been a disciplined entrepreneur. So we go back to those and we say, well, guys, you know, healthcare for the developing world is a good area to explore. There's a lot of people who need basic health care across Southeast Asia. Don't give up. Your doctors, you know what you're talking about. Just because your original idea for a mobile phone app, whatever, isn't going to work, don't give up. Keep going. <clears throat> so we will keep mentoring those people week by week, chatting to them remotely. They're from all around the world, by the way, people doing this program. Um, and to try and help them find, to discover a, a problem that's worth solving. And that's the first starting point. And I'd say the biggest single reason for startup failure that we see is the failure to identify a problem worth solving. People don't know what problem they're solving for whom. Um, they just aren't clear on that. They're launching a solution. They're, they're launching a solution and trying to find problems it can solve. And I think that's institutionalized in some cases. You know, many universities, for example, or research institutions are inventing interesting technology because it's interesting technology. But just because it could be done doesn't mean it should be done. And uh, the challenge, I think, is to bring some discipline into the, the process of deciding where we put our energy to try and build things that customers actually want. It's easy enough to build something interesting technically and give it away. But that's not a business. Thank you very much. So Thank you. Having you. Thanks for including me.